we shall continue our uh, discussion on the um, well decay. I have shown in the previous lecture that when you weld a stainless steel intragranular stress corrosion cracking does not occur adjacent to the weld fusion zone just immediate vicinity of the weld fusion zone there is no decay and uh, it occurs um, away from the heat temperature zone I mean I am sorry it occurs at the heat temperature zone which is away from the, the fusion zone. This is a kind of uh, welding done on um, on a stainless steel used for um, I think this is uh, wrong actually this is uh, 304 um, stainless steel weldment and uh, this is 316 uh, stainless steel weldment is carried out this is the kind of welding that people do to make the structures actually ok. And you can see that this is the fusion zone uh, you see this fusion zone here. Okay. And, um, and immediately next to the fusion zone uh, you do not see any kind of uh, well decay ok. And, uh, but if you just move away from the, the fusion zone you will get um, if you move away from the um, fusion zone in the heat temperature zone you see kind of problems that you normally you get in this actually again this is not a L actually it is uh, containing uh, 316 uh, stainless steel. Um, yeah very close to that you, you do not really see any kind of uh, well decay. Mm. This is kind of recapsulating what we saw in the morning. We looked at the uh, various weld techniques in the morning and we said that the sensitization behavior of a given stainless steel could change based on the welding technique for a given composition of the stainless steel. That is basically happening because of what? Why does why does the uh, different technique would lead to different sensitization early technique? It is the heat it is the heat input given by the welding techniques are different and so the extent of sensitization uh, differs uh, in depending upon the welding technique. The other important factor that is um, required to be understood is um, the thickness of stainless steel we call a sheet. Suppose you want to weld the thickness of the stainless steel plate a sheet. Now, if if I have go for a thicker sheet or thicker plate, if I want to weld at one go right, if you want to weld at one go, the amount of heat that is deposited per unit area is going to be quite large is not it you are going to build up layers right we build up layers and so the more amount of heat is now deposited onto the unit area and so it takes long time to cool it takes long time to cool and what will happen then it is possible that the cooling rate is high, is lower than the critical cooling rate required to avoid the sensitization so, that can be depicted by um, the simple uh, schematic diagram of uh, uh, time versus the, the temperature for uh, sheets of different thicknesses. They are welded at one go.
okay. I use thickness 1, thickness 2, thickness 3 and thickness 4. I have little bit you know I have just enlarged it is not going to be that wide actually ok. I just enlarge for convenience to make it. Now, can you tell me in this case uh, what order the thickness is increasing from the right right. The thickness 1 what represented here is uh, is the least thickness the thickness 4 is the most thick one right. In practice, we need to weld the thicker plates, the thicker tubes. You know, in a nuclear industry, for example, the tubes of one inch at above thickness are welded. Now, you are going to deposit heat more, but you need avoid sensitization, right? How to do that? How do you avoid sensitization in that case? You understood my question? You you cannot avoid. I mean, you cannot say that all the time I have only thick thin thin uh, sheets. I have to go for thick sheets, right? So if you're going for thick sheets and you want to weld, how do I avoid sensitization? Hmm? How do I avoid it? Can at least at least some some guys have already taken a welding course, right? Yes, it's a good answer, right? So you don't deposit a one go. You deposit once. You continue the layer. Allow it to cool. Then what you do? You deposit the second layer. Allow it to cool. So you each time when you weld you are allowing the weldment to lower its temperatures. In which process you are able to maintain adequate cooling rate, so that sensitization is avoided. So, we do what is called as multipass welding. In some cases, if it is a tube, for example, okay, you want to weld a tube, what one can do? The circumferential weld, right? Suppose there is a tube and uh, you want to weld a tube and you want to weld uh, two tubes, suppose you want to weld them, what you can do? First, you can weld and you can have water inside you start welding then what happens? Then the this gets a good coolant not only that it also builds up nice compressive stresses ok. So, it is in fact advantages for uh, minimizing sensitization it also minimizes stress corrosion cracking you will see later that when you normally weld a, a, a material you get a entire stress uh, we are not discussing this point here ok. So, um, there are various ways people weld in aerospace industries also they they, they normally cool it using um, a, a copper blocks. You can put a copper block and then start welding the copper block extracts the heat. There are several ways of uh, of uh, you know lowering the uh, the quantity of heat and then uh, increase the cooling rate. So, that you can avoid sensitization of um, weldments. So, these are the uh, uh, some factors uh, which uh, I think is is um, um,
are important in welding of uh, stainless steels. There is uh, one more problem that is concerned with stabilized grade stainless steels and that problem is called as knife line attack. It occurs in stabilized grade um, austenitic stainless steels. We talked about two grades of that one is um, type 3 to 1, the other one is type 3 4 7. And uh, in this what you do in this case uh, in type to uh, type uh, 3 to 1 it is titanium containing right. How much titanium you normally add anybody remember? It is about 8 times the carbon content is equal to the, the titanium added in this case. In this case tantalum plus niobium are together ok is equal to 10 times the carbon content. So, you can have 0 0.08 weight percent uh, carbon and uh, accordingly you can add titanium you all know that the, the, the titanium combines with carbon and no free carbon available when you weld it there is no sensitization. But knife line attack is, is a special case that happens when you weld thick plates. So, you weld it as I told you uh, thick plates require multi pass welding without which you are going to lead to sensitization right. And uh, in this case uh, this is a, any one of that it could be a, a 3 to 1 or 347. What they found was the attack occurs very close to fusion zone. And into the the base metal. So, at the base metal side you will have very close to this it happens ok, very close. This is called KLA. Very close it happens. Very interestingly KLA does not occur in low carbon stainless steels. We need to understand this and please notice they do not occur at the regular uh, heat affected zone that happens you know in a in a normal uh, 304 stainless steel it occurs very close to the to the fusion zone in the in the base metal. 
why does it happen? In order to understand this, you need to understand the, the thermal cycle, right. If you weld a single pass weld, okay, if you do a single pass weld, what is the thermal cycle for that? Temperature, right? It goes up, it cools like that. Single pass, right? That means um, but if I have to cover it at one go, okay, and I measure this temperature here, okay, it measure anywhere the temperatures, okay, any here or here, anywhere. Okay, it it of course the, the the highest temperature may change, but the cycle is going to be same. If we're going to do a multi-pass welding, suppose. Let us assume that this is the place I want to notice here. I am going to put a thermocouple here and I do a single welding goes like this. If I am going to put one more layer over here, what happens? Again, look at this, this zone very close to the close to the fusion zone huh? this is the first pass the second pass in the first pass when i weld here when I weld at this lo location, the temperature goes to very high, maybe around 1200, 1300 may go. It does not melt. Please look at next to the fusion zone, it does not melt, but the temperature goes much higher than the weld decay zone. Maybe the temperature may be around about 1200 to 1400. When I move up here, Suppose I start welding here, this location is going to follow something like an heat effector zone for this area. When I start moving up this, somewhere move up, what happens? This the distance is sufficient enough for me to consider this as heat effector zone. So, this temperature is in the range of what? In the range of this probably it goes around about. 800 degree Celsius and this temperature region may be 450 and 850 degree Celsius. So, here it is acting like a heat temperature zone for this because it is sufficiently far away from this location, right. This is the heat temperature zone for this, right. If I move away from this, this becomes heat temperature zone for this, is not it? The distance is somehow same, am I right or not? So, what happens now? So, this is the reason why the knife line attack occurs. Now, let us look at what is happening to the, to the metallurgy of this particular weldment in this case and this case. We need to understand stability of the carbides.
Cr23 C6 is a carbide that forms what is the temperature region? It is between say 400, 450 and 850 degrees Celsius right and this is a gamma phase. What other carbides you have here? You also have you have Cr23, Cc can be there, you can have titanium carbide, tantalum carbide and niobium carbide. Look at this. All carbides. What is the temperature? Around about 1200. Understood or not? The titanium, tantalum, niobium carbides form in the temperature region of 850 and 1200 degrees Celsius. The chromium carbides form between 450 and 850, right? Above 850, what happens to chromium carbide? Dissolves. Then what is happening to titanium carbide and all? Starts forming. This carbide dissolves and these carbides form. And above this temperature, only gamma is there and no tantalum carbide, niobium carbide, all these stuffs are not there, okay? Understood? Now, let us look at the well thermal cycle, right? In a multi pass welding, what do you do? Is, is temperature time is not okay. I am going to draw here twelve hundred. It is about 1400, I am going to put it about 1200, okay. So, what is happening here? The stabilized grade stainless steel consists of what? It consists of tantalum, niobium or one of these carbides, they are present in that, right. When you raise this temperature, what is happening to these carbides? They all dissolve now, right, they dissolve, okay, that is uh, they dissolve. When you again raise it to this temperature, what happens now? This is in the range of four fifty and it will say, so what happens now? Suppose you read again, what happens now? What forms? Chromium carbide forms. Please notice in a weldment, okay, in a weldment, I just come back to this place here. In a weldment, This is the melting temperature here, it goes beyond the melting temperature. This place very close weld fusion zone in the base metal does not melt, it is lower than melting point, but the temperature is sufficient for the titanium carbide to dissolve. In the heat weld zone, what happens here? In the so called weldic zone, what happens here? Here, here the temperature is between 850 and 450, but nothing happens because the titanium carbide still remains as a titanium carbide. It does not dissolve and so chromium carbide also will not form. So, here you have no issue, right? Here it is dissolves here. When it dissolves, please understand no sensitization. Chromium carbide form because you are reheating it. You are reading it by welding process. If you do, if see, for example, if you take 3 to 1, you do a single pass welding, 
what will happen? There will be no sensitization. Why? Titanium carbide dissolves, but does not mean the chromic carbide forms automatically. That means, still the carbon is in solid solution, chromic carbide does not form. So, if you happen to weld 3 to 1 single foss welding, a thin plate, suppose you do that, then you have no issue. Because the thick plate, because you are welding at different you know uh, heights, the lower one becomes interpreter zone for the upper ones and so the chromium carbide starts forming. So, these places the chromium carbide starts forming. When the chromium carbide starts forming, then you get sensitization and that is why it is very close to this. Please notice if you, if you move away from it, if the temperature is lower than 1200, nothing happens. Titanium carbide is still stable. So, that means you do not want to get any sensitization here nor here and you get only very close to this ok. So, that is the reason why it happens in the in the in the uh, in the in the thermal cycle basically the first one leads to dissolution of titanium carbide. The second one when it becomes heat better zone for the subsequent welding the chromium carbides form. And so, it leads to what is called as sensitization taking place and that is a problem that happens in the stabilized grade stainless steels. It does not happen in low carbon stainless steels because what? Why? Because in low carbon stainless steels carbon is not there to form chromium carbon at all and any anyway you are going to cool it down. So, in uh, in the case of low carbon stainless steels you will not get nephron attack. You get nephron attack only in the case of the stabilized grade that too when you weld the thick plates. You do not weld the thick plates you will not get this kind of problems ok. Are there any questions any of you have any doubts? Why does TIC titanium carbide not dissolve at lower temperature and lower temperature range curve? Yeah, titanium carbide, does not titanium carbide is stable you know, titanium carbide is stable at ambient temperature does not form. See if you hold the 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 uh, stabilized grade stainless steel at this temperature, what is the likely phase formation? Only titanium carbide forms, chromium carbide does not form. For some reason, I do not hold here, I, I first take it to this temperature, right? I hold it here, I dissolve all of them, then I bring it to this temperature, what will happen? Chromium carbide will form, sensation will occur. Whereas, when I move from this temperature to this temperature, Chromium carbide does not form. Instead, you get titanium carbide or tantalum or niobium carbides, all the carbon is gone. When you lower the temperatures, the chromium does not get enough carbon to form chromium carbides. So, this is why the stabilized grade stainless steels or resistance against sensitization, and that is the reason why it is you see why why they call stabilized grade stainless steels. The stabilized grade stainless steels are made in this manner. Please note down. You normally hold the stabilized grade stainless steels above 1200, 1250, 1235, depending upon the carbon content. You hold it here. That means, in which case, all the carbides dissolve. Then you bring it down this temperature region, somewhere around 850, 900, you, you hold it here. Then what happens? All the carbon combines to form titanium carbide in 3 to 1, tantalum niobium carbide in 3 to 7, then you cool it. That is the way you use your you use your stabilized grade stainless steels. The stabilized grade stainless steels have carbides. What carbides are they? They are titanium carbide in one case, tantalum and niobium carbide in another case. If they do not have it, then you weld it, you still are going to have problems ok. So, stabilization treatment means the formation of these carbides in these stainless steels. That is why these stainless steels are always given a stabilization treatment. What do you mean by stabilization? Just fix all the carbon, so that no free carbon is available for subsequent uh, sensitization process ok. So, is, is it clear actually to you? Any of you have any questions ok. So, you should know now the difference between well decay and Nephron attack. 
well decay occurs in in stainless steels having higher carbon content whereas my friend attack occurs only in the stabilized grade stainless steels the second issue is that it depends upon the thermal history if you don't reheat it then what happens you will not get any sensitization the third difference is the well decay occurs quite away from the fusion zone the nafline attack occurs very close to the fusion zone there are three distinct differences occurring here so these are the important factors i am going to ask another question to you suppose i have taken a stabilized grade stainless steel it is not very thick but it is it is thin i welded only once but i am going to apply to a process where the temperature is held in the range of 500 degrees celsius the liquid is kept at 500 degrees celsius so what will happen i have i have two cases i have taken 304l stainless steel i welded only once only the thin the thin tube 3 to 1 also is a thin tube i have only welded only once only single pass right after welding i am putting to a process where the environment is held at the temperature of 500 degrees celsius what would happen to 3 to 1 and what will happen to 304l you please tell, let me know so i am going to leave that question to you you please think over let us discuss it uh, in the next class i want you to get into the into the problem and uh, by doing so you will understand the basics of of uh, well decay and knife line attack ok. These two are important things. So, uh, we have uh, reasonably covered uh, what is called as uh, sensitization and well decay and you also know how do you avoid avoid or prevention of well decay or sensitization okay, okay come on come on tell me how do you avoid it? Low carbon stainless steels. Yeah, two. Yeah, stabilize grade. For example, three two one and three four seven stainless steels. Third, if you can solution nice, if can be done, it is not possible in practice in a, in a structure you are going to do a heat exchanger and how are you going to do this, but a small you know small sections small components yeah it, it still can be done ok. One of the important thing that which uh, which we need to consider in well decay is carbon absorption. So, I have taken let us say a type uh, 304L stainless steel. Suppose I have taken this and the guy has welded, is found nicely sensitized. What he did, he did not do was he did not do degreasing. The surface had some carbonaceous matter, right, some grease or something. He welded it picks up carbon quite a bit. So, carbon pickup in low carbon stainless steels 
or quite easy it happens. So, you need to be extremely careful in welding uh, low carbon stainless steels this is process related ones ok. Two it also happens in the castings. Suppose, I go for type 304 L stainless steel casting and I got a casting ok. So, very interestingly the surface sensitized center looks fine and as you start moving inside uh, the extent of sensitization decreases. Please note it is casting. How many of you are familiar with the foundry technology here? Foundry you prepare a mold right you prepare a mold in the mold you pour the 3 or 4 L stainless steels the carbon content is 0 0.03 or lower ok. The surface is getting like this what do you think happens? if the mold as carbonaceous matter right yes matter if it has got carbon right in the in the material right it can pick up so the mold it depends on the mold right so, but that's why it's only on the periphery not in the center you can shave off it can happen or better way is that go for a like a ceramic mold or something which does not give away the carbon content. So, you see sometimes it is it is happening um, and so you must know how do you tackle the problem. Among all the corrosion issues two types of problems we have developed extensive testing. One is on sensitization well decay, the other one is on stress corrosion cracking several type of tests you see that ok. Industrially they are very important. I will be very brief here and you can always uh, go to the uh, standards and you can read ok. You see one can take about an hour or so even more also because it is a very important topic, but we do not have time. So, we will not go into uh, in details about this A S T M A 262 is um, the standard and this standard has type A B, C, D, E and F. So, we have type A, type B, ASTM A262 A, ASTM A262 B, they call it like that. Various types of test people do that. The predominantly people use A type A, this is called as oxalic acid. H test. You might have done a test in the lab, right? What have you done there? Ok. You applied, you used uh, 10 percent oxalic acid, right? This is, is it is 10 percent oxalic acid. You would applied, uh, you made the sample into a anode, right? It is an anode. And what did you do? You looked at the, uh, you applied a current of 1 ampere right, 1 ampere per centimeter square for about 90 seconds. And uh, you you look at the uh, at the um, specimen in the um, microscope, you would have got somewhat similar to the structures. Please notice that um, 
that is a magnification supposed to be between 250 and 500 that is the reason behind that ok. Very low magnification you you might not be able to see grain boundaries properly very high magnification you would not see grain at all you know so magnified actually ok. So, you would not see many number of grains. So, it is that range it is seen now we can see the step structure we discussed already right and then the uh, this is called dual structures and then you have a disk structures. What is the definition of a disk structure anybody? If you observe the sample in the magnification 250 and 500 at least one grain is completely enveloped with the disk structures at least one grain completely enveloped. So, not necessary that all of them are completely enveloped only one at least one is sufficient to do that. Please do understand you know you you, you guys have to be precise in your thing otherwise if you are going to do some, some advice with someone I think it will be <laughs> really pathetic kind of ok. So, you have to be precise in the things. Now, this is your, your disk structure because it is not completely enveloped I am sorry this is a dual structure it is not completely enveloped the disk structure and this. Please look at I just wanted to point out one you may able to see here right. Can you see this this grain can you see this here. Similarly, um, can you can you can you see here? What do you see here? What do you see here? What do you see here? Okay, what do you see here? What do you see here? Twins, twins. And in twins, right? The twins you see there this is not sensitized. We we talked about low angle grain boundary, high angle grain boundary, right? You see that the annealing twins are not at all sensitized. So it's a grain boundary. Okay. So, they are least uh, sensitive to sensitization. So, that is another story altogether. Is that you can see here also you see you can see this right you see this ok. You can see that there is you see you see here also ok. Now, this test what you need to understand primarily I am not going to you know tell everything what you need to understand is what is the purpose of these tests. A, B, C. This one is talks about you know it talks about only the the uh, uh, you know various carbides. Please notice when you apply one ampere, it goes to a very high transpassive region, you know, and so the carbides also dissolve at this particular uh, potentials and this one is talks about acceptable or suspected. Acceptable means there is no uh, sensitization if it is a dual or uh, destructure that means you may do further test with B, C, D, E, F to confirm whether the material is good enough for application. If the oxalic acid H test shows a dual structure or D structures, you need to do this test actually. Now, each of these tests I again I know there is no time to see here they are um, they are all of uh, different kind. For example, this one we use nitric acid. This is nitric acid plus HF. It is a modified test of this, it is slightly milder. So, I want you to people go through this, and these guys they talk about carbides, they also talk about sigma phases, all this and all kind of things, ok. So, you need to be looking at, ok. So, in order to so, in order to uh, so, this is very very aggressive test right sigma phases and uh, carbides and you know and again chromium depletion region that is the primary thing in all cases right. So, it is it is it is it is it even if you have a sigma phase it will start attacking. So, they are modified to this test say D is better than that. So, each of them have some reason why 
people carry out different type of tests. I think you people should uh, you know when you have time go through in details and get to know why different types of ASTM test are, uh, are carried out. What I would like to focus on here is um, the quantification of of this test actually ok. Quantification of IGC please notice we are talking about IGC of stainless steels only quantification of this and we use electrochemical potential dynamic reactivation test. You might be also doing this if you are not done ok. This is also part of your lab experience. Now, what is the basis of this test? What is the science behind here? The science behind here is you choose an electrolyte that passivates the grains, but does not passivate chromium depleted grain boundaries. Please notice this ok only chromium depleted grain boundaries it does not uh, pass it, but that means it is not sensitized grain boundaries as well as the grains they remain passive right. So, the selection of this electrolyte should be such that this character is given to the electrolyte. Now, the electrolyte uh, has got two components one is sulfuric acid other is potassium thiocyanate potassium thiocyanate is given right. This one is to passivate this is to depassivate you know sulfur containing compounds are uh, detrimental for passivation we have seen it during our studies on pitting right. So, passivate and the depassivate. Now, this is a depassivator if I am going to choose this concentration very high concentration it will depassivate everything grains, grain boundaries and all of them right. So, I need to optimize this concentration. I need sulfuric acid because the sulfuric acid is the what passivates the stainless steel. So, the concentration of sulfuric acid this are optimally chosen and in this case of stainless steels 304 and all people use 0.5 molar sulfuric acid plus 0.01 molar potassium thiocyanate. Now, how they got this thing by deterioration process there is no real scientific uh, you know extrapolation that we can do all done by shear extrapolation as uh, shear iterations to happen and so they arrive at this particular concentration for this stainless steel. The same thing is not applicable for duplex stainless steel nickel based alloys no they are not applicable this is applicable only for the for the 304 and probably 316 and so you need to change the composition in case uh, the uh, alloy alloys are changed. This is called as the, the EPR test electrochemical potential dynamic reactivation yeah EPR test ok EPR test 
There are two types of things that people do here. One is called as single loop test. What is done here is um, I am not describing to you the scan rate and uh, bubbling all kind of stuff actually ok. I do not do, do that. In a single loop uh, EPR test what you do is you start in the beginning you start from 200 millivolts with respect to uh, saturated calm electrode. From there you come down ok. So, this is how it is done here. This is the sensitized case. If it is not sensitized, please correct the things, ok. If it is not sensitized, you get uh, like this. When you hold it at plus 200 millivolt and completely passivating, please see that. Here in this case, if you look at the alloy, you may everything passivates, complete passivation. Both grain boundary and grain. But here, what happens? Here, passivates. Grain boundary does not pass it. So, the current that is flowing here is essentially due to what? Due to the dissolution of the grain, grain boundary. Now, you can calculate the number of coulombs, right? What is coulombs? Current multiplied by the time gives you the coulombs. You know the coulombs of current by integrating this whole curve, you get the coulombs. Now, you know the grain boundary area, then you can calculate the, the extent of sensitization. So, P A is given as Q the coulombs upon what? Upon grain boundary area. So, this is, this is nothing but coulombs per unit area, right? Centimeter square, right? And uh, grain bound area, you know, you guys who have done the metallography studies, you know how to calculate the grain bound area. You calculate that from the ASTM grain size number, right? So that is is equal to AS five point zero nine five by 10 power minus 3 exponential 0 0.347 x whereas A s the sample area for which you get the current. x is the ASTM grain size at 100 x. This you might have uh, studied in the you know in your metallography courses right. So, you know the grain boundary area and uh, you can find out the q value and you can find out the p a and the PA is, is indication of the extent of sensitization. Now, people use this technique for qualifying materials in the nuclear industries ok. And uh, I give you some indication of this PA versus uh, PA value ok. And, uh, 
and what you call implicate what is what are the implications implications or interpretations that if P A is going to be less than 2 unsensitized. Please notice these are all empirical one right, there is no fundamental principles in that no pitting 2 to 5 slightly sensitized. pitting and IGC attack, the granular attack takes place 5 to 15 sensitized. Pitting attack of entire grain boundaries. greater than 15 heavily sensitized. So, these are in fact routinely used in the, the nuclear industries to, um, to qualify the material for uh, for um, you know uh, applications in the boiling water reactors and all this stuff. This test is a little more uh, complicated. There is one more test which is more sim more simple is double loop EPR test. This is what you might be doing in the in the laboratory. Hmm. This is also called as DL EPR. In this case, um, unlike single loop EPR, where you rise the potential to the passive region and then you bring it to ECAR, the double loop EPR test what is done here is you start from ECAR. You go up to um, plus 300 millivolts with respect to saturated canvas electrode. Then what happens? You reverse the scan, and it goes like that, do like this only. It's forward, uh, forward, forward, reverse, reverse and this is called as I forward, this is called as I reverse. Actually you do not have to know the area of the sample and you can simply use any area and you can plot only current not necessarily current density ok. Now, please notice when you scan from E car up to this here up to this point grains and grain boundary they are all dissolved. Here what happens? Grains and grain boundary passivate and what happens here? grains remain passive, grain boundaries depassivate if sensitized ok. Now, that means, this current if you can integrate corresponds to what? Corresponds to the dissolution of the grain boundary 
and you integrate this one will correspond to the, uh, to the, the overall material right. So, you do not have to integrate also what you can do is you can simply take these values like the degree of sensitization can be written as i reverse i forward is the fraction of this one right. This gives you the fraction of the uh, grain boundaries that suffer intergranular corrosion. So, this is also used as one of the uh, uh, quantitative tests to quantify to what extent the sensitization has occurred ok. If there are no questions I think with this now we come to end of intergranular corrosion and well decay of stainless steels ok. I just want to move on to another type of intergranular corrosion uh, unless you have any questions or clarification to be sought. Let me go to the um, next important material which is uh, aluminum alloys. In principle I think the uh, intergranular corrosion can occur in all all materials. Aluminum is one of the you know material which is uh, very susceptible to intergranular corrosion. Next is your maybe your zinc alloys you know you have zinc die castings you will use right and uh, magnesium alloys also can undergo uh, intergranular corrosion. But those things I am not going to discuss now we will uh, end our discussions with aluminum alloys because it has got wider implications in industries. Now, in aluminum alloys the intergranular corrosion turns to a different uh, you know connotation which is called as exfoliation damage or exfoliation corrosion ok you can call it. You know what is mean by exfoliation right and if exfoliation what does it mean centrally? We call layer by layer removal right it is kind of plane by plane removal kind of thing. In aluminum alloy this uh, this integral corrosion takes into and especially um, 2000 series aluminum alloys and 7000 series aluminum alloys. These two alloys are uh, they are all high strength alloys right they are high strength alloys. They are used in the as a rolled sheets extruded you know components ok. When you roll and then extrude what happens? you get you get a, a special kind of microstructures. This is a montage optical montage of uh, one of my students you know PhD students who worked on this alloy actually. And um, you see the, how the grains look at uh, at different uh, you know directions actually right. This is the rolling plane right this is rolling plane and this is the uh, uh, thickness right the thickness short transverse and this is the long transverse ok long transverse. Now, look at the grains now ok look at these grains <coughs> they are all well elongated right I hope you are able to see this elongated grains can you see that can you see this elongated grains and these grains are called as pancake you put you stack the pancake and you slice it see at the sides you see nice connection in fact the pancake only right you you take a material and you you roll it 
it is comprised of several layers are going to be there right. They call pancake structures. In the exfoliation what happens is that these uh, grains just you know delaminate just one after another they get removed from the surface from subsurface ok. So, that is that is that is one of the uh, specific problem that happens in the in the high strength aluminum alloys. Now, why do they really happen? How many of you have studied aluminum alloys physical metallurgy aluminum alloys? How do you get the strength of aluminum alloys? Aging right it is called precipitation hardening treatment right. You do you age the aluminum alloys right you when you age the aluminum alloys what happens? The excess solutes which are super saturated they dissolve and form precipitates and the age hardening is of course, a big subject altogether, but to make it simple the two types of aging are important for us. One is called as a peak aging, other is called as a over aging treatment. What is peak aging treatment? The peak aging treatment is the treatment at which the hardness of the alloy becomes the maximum, the tensile strength becomes maximum and you, you over age you, you continue the aging treatment or you raise the temperature you do whatever the strength falls down, hardness falls down may be 10 to 15 percent or whatever ok. You normally do that in order to increase the resistance against stress corrosion cracking we are not talking about right now. I just want to give an idea why you do over aging, why you are losing your strength. You are losing your strength because at peak aging alloy are prone to stress corrosion cracking and so they do over aging. In over aging look at this the precipitates become coarse you see the precipitates very 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 coarse precipitates and the grain bound precipitates also become coarse. These are the grain bound precipitates you see here is very fine and these are grain interior precipitates are very fine and so it is has high strength. In this case because of coarsening effect strength becomes low. Not only that the composition of these precipitates also change. In this case, this alloy is, is actually is a 7010 aluminum alloy, it is called AA7010 uh, alloy, and this is essentially what are these precipitates? There are zinc and um, magnesium precipitates, and certain amount of copper is present here, right? And uh, they are all almost equilibrium precipitates are there. Over here, it is yeah, it has again zinc, a magnesium, and have quite large amount of copper ok. So, the precipitates become relatively noble here as compared to this why you take aluminum and compare that to magnesium, magnesium is active. In fact, even zinc also active because zinc does not form a passivation. When you add copper to it the precipitate becomes noble. So, they become noble precipitates with respect to the matrix. In this case the precipitate become active compared to the matrix that means, they can undergo selective dissolution here there is no selective dissolution here taking place. So, the intragranular corrosion occurs more in the case of peak age alloys as compared to the over age alloys I hope you understand the point right it happens here. Now, the problem that happens here is that when they are they are pancake structures when they have pancake structure like this when corrosion occurs on the surface may be due to pitting whatever the corrosion proceeds inside the proceeds inside like that the proceeds like that along these things now right. It can proceed like this like this also like this can proceed like this. When the corrosion proceeds here it forms let us say zinc dissolves magnesium dissolves what happens now? Now, the volume of these products higher than the volume of the metal dissolved is not it because it has got a hydroxide all this right is higher. When this volume is more what will happen now in this case what will happen? It is going to strain it is going to lift the thing now it is going to lift up now that means, the grain starts opening there is going to be now internal stresses in addition to corrosion 
happening because of preferential dissolution of the grain boundary precipitates, it is also going to exert certain stresses and so there is going to be delamination along the grain boundaries. The grains start lifting from from the from the uh, material uh, below the subsurface. So, it is exfoliates they delaminate actually. So, that is what really happens in the case of in the case of this materials. If you want to see how it happens, I can show you a diagram how these guys can happen. See here, ok. Now, this is a peak caged, you can see the corrosion has started from the surface, it gone inside, it, it created so many corrosion products, it got lifted. Please see this is not corroded, it is corroded, this is volume of the product, it has got, got lifted actually. In the over edge condition, it does not happen. Why it does not happen? Because the precipitates here are noble compared to this. When they are noble, the precipitates do not dissolve so much and so the grain boundary becomes stable. So, as compared to this, that means exfoliation corrosion occurs only in the case of peak age conditions, they do not they do not happen in the case of over edge conditions because of this particular thing. Not only that, in the over edge conditions, one more thing happens actually. You see, in this case, if you look at closely the grain boundary precipitates they become very coarse, they are separated. Look at this is this one precipitate separated. So, that means they are separated now. So, there is a even when it, it corrodes less, but even when it corrodes, they are not good connect. So, they are not connecting, the grain boundary is not getting connected completely here. Whereas, in this case, because the precipitates are very fine, get connected, what happens? So, the, the the the, the 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 crack or whatever you know uh, corrosion products accumulates it starts lifting in this case actually right it has happened. So, because of nobility of the precipitates because these precipitates are well isolated the grain boundaries do not continuously corrode and lift actually. So, the over edge alloys are more stable as compared to the peak edge alloys ok. So, that is the reason why the peak edge alloys are better off compared to over edge alloys uh, compared to peak edge uh, I mean I am sorry uh, that is the reason why the over edge alloys are better off compared to the peak edge alloys and peak edge alloys uh, or uh, you know. Uh, so, in any case if you do not use peak edge alloys uh, for um, for um, actual uh, application because peak edge alloys are more prone to stress corrosion cracking Th those days you know you were using at all. So, um, so it is very essential uh, for us to understand the the, the the chemistry of the precipitates and how do they dissolve. So, so people have done extensive studies on that and those you people who want to do a M tech project or maybe a PhD work you can you can you can read more and understand them. For the time being it is enough for us to understand that the grain boundary precipitates are very important, this chemistry is very important and even more important is the alignment of the grains, they are pancake structures ok and so they lift it and leading to exfoliation or corrosion. Now, there are different types of tests that people do and one test is called as X code test ok. And uh, there is also ASTM standard, there is also ASTM standard uh, which is used as X code test where you use a highly uh, concentrated sodium chloride plus potassium nitrate and plus nitric acid and uh, you see if it is if it is a uh, if it is peak age thing and you see the surface is quite rough huh? and over is little less less rough actually and uh, you know this is a different kind of alloy system that you have. So, uh, when you do the S code test and you can take a cross section and you can see them in the in the in the microscope you see lifting of the grains as I seen in the uh, as I shown in the previous um, uh, slide actually. And this test is uh, considered to be uh, very aggressive. There is also modified X code test, ASTM uh, things are available for you. You can use modi modified X code test to do that, ok. Um, okay. So, that is about the uh, exfoliation and intragranular corrosion of, uh, of aluminum alloys. Um, there are there are several factors the way you temper the surface hardness, rolling conditions. Uh, they are also affect the exfoliation corrosion. 
there are certain good research papers uh, some of you are interested you can you can read them and uh, advice for this course I think it is sufficient for you to know that this is one of the serious problems. See what happens uh, in, in aluminum alloys uh, in aircraft industries how do they join the aluminum alloys are joined by riveting process. So, they drill a they drill a hole right uh, they drill a hole and then they are riveted using other aluminum uh, you know metal right and this hole you know look at this is a hole here right. The whole hole is exposed now the grains are all now exposed you see is like pancake structure you know I hope you will able to understand it right. You take a sheet and drill a hole and all this surfaces are now exposed to getting attacked in the horizontally you know. So, they get lifted ok and there are very beautiful uh, pictures available I cannot show you here because of uh, copyright problems, but you guys can read and see it is a very nice uh, you know illustration of how. Uh, grain water attack and lift the uh, you know uh, various grains up and causing the weakness it weaken it weakens the structures actually ok. Uh, well, uh, with this uh, any questions anybody? How IGC of stainless steel is different from that of aluminum alloys? Yeah and uh, ok. It is a very good question actually right. The intragranular corrosion in stainless steel, the mechanism is different from the intragranular corrosion in aluminum alloys. I, I did not, in fact, dwell on it, right. The in aluminum alloy, what is the element that passivates? The matter itself. The major element aluminum itself is passivating, right. So, when there is a precipitation taking place, what is the precipitation taking place? What is the precipitation here? The precipitation in this one is what is zinc and magnesium. So, the passivating element remains in the grain boundary area. So, there I mean basically the matrix passivation does not get affected, but what is happening instead? The precipitates which form on the grain boundary are selectively attacked here because they are relatively active compared to the aluminum here. So, the mechanism in the stainless steel is the chromium which is passivating is getting depleted and so, grain boundaries are getting attacked right. Here the passivating element is aluminum that is not getting affected rather what is happening the active elements is segregate and form precipitates in the grain boundary and so, they get corroded off. So, it is not the depletion of passivating element causes problem here it is the formation of the uh, of the active phases on the grain boundaries causing the problem. So, the mechanism in both the cases are different actually ok. Any questions? Ok, if there are no questions further on this and uh, I still given you one problem please think over it ok and come out with the answer uh, when you meet next time. So, thank you very much.